Um, so the title of the talk is, is, is the future of DevSecOps or DevSecOps transformation. Um, so if I want to talk about the future, you, Robert Kiyosaki, Kiyosaki says you should study the past. So I'm going to point to a few things in, our, in the past that I think will be relevant here and help us to forecast the future. Um, the first thing I want to sort of highlight in the past is Agile. So um, the Agile movement was a big change in the way software development was done. One of the interesting things about the Agile movement is it broke down silos between development and QA in particular, although product was also another silo it broke down partially. The way you think about it as an Agile team member is that the Agile team then became responsible for the owner, they became ownership of the QA, the quality of the products they were producing. Um, and instead of the QA group owning it, now the development team owns it. Um, they were not necessarily always worthy of this trust. I, I remember getting up on stage and giving talks at the beginning of the Agile movement. That's, that's in my background. I was an early um, transformation consultant for Agile transformation. And I would leave the stage and I would go walk out into the hallway and I would get flooded by these QA folks that were like, yeah, that's a great talk. And in theory, that sounds great, but it'll never work at my organization because of blank. And they would fill in that blank with something that told me they didn't trust the development team. Now, back then I had a pretty flippant answer that you're gonna have to trust them, they're worthy of it already, but they really weren't worthy of it in a lot of cases. And, I, and, and if I had to do it over and again now, I would use a structure like what I'm proposing for DevSecOps that helps them to become worthy of it. Um, the one thing to note is that it wasn't just a, a, a transplant, the same things that QA people were doing. A lot of QA departments disappeared with the Agile movement and, and certainly like chief quality officer roles uh, are almost non-existent today. Um, the, the QA people moved on to the development team and some of them left and some of them had different skills and et cetera. But, but in general, developers want to do it differently. And, and, and in particular, they want to do it with automation and they want to do it um, with different tools. And so a perfect example of this is, is HP's Quality Center. HP Quality Center started declining in use in sales um, soon after the Agile movement sort of really took off. And, um, you know, they sold out to Microfocus and it was renamed to ALM, Agile Lifecycle Management Quality Center at some point, but that was too late. It was just, they were trying to put Agile lipstick on a traditional QA pig. And I think we do a lot of that today in the DevSecOps world. We put DevOps lipstick, meaning not real DevOps, on a traditional security tool or practice or whatever. And it doesn't really translate well. You have to actually shift left, not just shit left as, as my, my coworker now, Jeff Williams and the founder of OWASP says, um, you, yeah, you can't just sort of transplant the exact same practice over. It's gonna actually morph when it does that. And it was all around culture change. It was, this is about changing people's mindsets to change their behavior. And you couldn't necessarily, always lead with a mindset shift. You, you sometimes had to like sort of try the behavior out and that led to the mindset shift. So it's a little bit of a virtuous cycle here you gotta get with culture change going. Um, but Agile itself didn't really take off until this other thing that I wanna say in our past we should study, Scrum took off. And, and so let's talk a little bit about some of the elements of Scrum that I think were sort of key to its success. Um, it introduced fundamentally new terminology. And, and in some cases, the terms it introduced look a lot like the terms that existed before, but those older terms, for instance, iteration was replaced in Scrum with the phrase sprint. They had different connotations and they, and they had baggage. And, and Ken Schwaber uh, and, and Jeff Sutherland did a really genius job of essentially coming up with terms that sort of left the baggage behind. And I think we're stuck. Words will ossify old mindsets and, and you sort of fall into, oh, when someone says this, I think that. But now with the new way of working, when someone says this, I, I need them to think differently about that. And so in some ways, I think we're gonna have to introduce new terminology to pull it off. 
they actually had to introduce two new roles that weren't really in practice. I mean, you could say there was project management, but that's very different than the definition of a product owner. And a scrum master, you could say there was like a SDLC consultant kind of coach or whatever, but but really the, the definition of the scrum master is, is a fundamental introduction that really didn't exist before, before scrum came about. And they had a simple metrics and visualization system. The pre-software engineering, the pre-agile software engineering world had gotten very heavyweight with its metrics and it wasn't very consumable by the average development team. And, and Scrum greatly simplified that and made, made it very easy to understand your progress and, and where you're going. Um, and I think we're gonna need that for DevSecOps. We don't have that right now. We don't have simple, we have dashboard overload. Um, interestingly enough, Scrum actually predates the Agile Manifesto. It was the prototypes for Scrum were actually out there in as early as 1995. But Scrum itself didn't really take off um, until a few other things happened. They published a 13-page Scrum guide. There's now actually a, a roughly nine-page of content Scrum guide out. Um, so it got even smaller over the years. It got bigger for a while, but it got smaller just in 2020. Um, that's a great, that's the best version so far of the Scrum Guide, for instance. Um, and it, you know, you didn't need to read a whole book. You didn't need to get a consultant to teach you. You could, you could read this Scrum Guide and you could always refer back to it when you had a question about, should you do it this way or should you do it that way? And we don't have that in DevSecOps. We have a, some folks who sort of like introducing maturity models, et cetera. And there's no real this sort of concrete sort of small guidance that we're going to need. Um, and there was an in ecosystem of certified professionals. And that's starting to evolve, but I think they're focused on the wrong thing. I think they're focused on the particular DevSecOps practices. And what I think we need to focus on is actually how do you get people to adopt them? And so I'm, I'm gonna talk about a model where, where we did that. The third and last sort of example from the past, I think to help us predict the future is this idea of shadow IT. And, and so shadow IT was the der early derogatory term because IT took three months to get a new server when you submitted a request. Um, and shadow IT took three clicks to get a new server. It's a little pithy sort of um, way to sort of refer to it. But the idea here was that, you know, IT was not keeping up with the pace of development and they had to go around them. And that's exactly what's happening in security now. Security is not keeping up with the pace of development and they're finding ways around them. Um, it, the interesting thing, and, and, and this wasn't universally true, but, and, and, and the IT guys denied it for years after it was mostly true. Um, the interesting thing is that the developer way of doing it, it, for the most part, actually resulted in higher quality, more reliability, and better security. And, and they did it without trading off speed. In fact, they got gains in speed. The old mental model of you can either have speed or you can have safety or security or quality or reliability, that's not really true anymore with DevOps approaches to things. You actually get, get both. Both go up when you follow the DevOps approach. Um, most, a lot of security folks don't buy that. They have trouble with that, but, but it really is the message of DevOps. And, 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 and I've seen it really come true um, if you do it the right way. And just like you could do shadow IT the wrong way and have worse security. Um, but you, if you did it the right way, you actually end up with better um, security. So now we just refer to shadow IT. That's an old phrase. Maybe you've never even heard of it. Uh, we just call that cloud native because that's sort of the way developers uh, really want to work. And IT departments sort of had to catch up. And I think that's sort of what's starting now with DevSecOps is the security groups are having to catch up with the mindset. And, and, and even if they can articulate a little bit the mindset, they haven't deeply felt it and they haven't taken the tough pills like terminating, getting rid of, dissolving, moving the people in their QA department onto the development teams. They haven't done that in security yet. And, and, and that's the disruption that's probably coming here. Okay, so Kawasaki, Ki Kiyosaki said, um, study the past to predict the future, but Peter Drucker says the best way to predict the future is to actually create it. So I'm going to talk about a prototype uh, that we that we used. But before I get into that, I want to sort of sort of give you a foundation in what I mean by DevSecOps. And and I I, I said um, it's not just DevOps lipstick on a traditional security pig. And and I also mentioned about Scrum being 
the development team taking ownership of quality. So I think of DevSecOps as really the development team taking ownership of security. And, and that's sort of really the key of their products um, and being worthy of it, not just being told you now have it, but not knowing what to do. Um, the interesting thing is I, I don't actually have a separate definition for DevOps. I sort of have a love hate relationship because if you're doing DevOps right, the security is already baked in. And, and I find that teams that are doing true DevOps have a very short lift. It's, very, very, it's not very difficult or long lift to sort of up the game to the level that I'd really like them to be at. Um, and it's the teams that are doing traditional AppSec and more sort of pre-DevOps development that have a much harder time. So I really think of Agile led to, to, to DevOps leads to DevSecOps. If you try to go straight from Agile to, to DevSecOps, it, it, it doesn't actually result in the, the, the gains of both speed and quality or, rely, or reliability or security when you do that. So um, I'm gonna talk about the prototype of, of um, Comcast as uh, the, the um, prototype we're gonna talk about for, for this, this feature. Um, so I spent five years at Comcast. I started with just a small, it was just me. And I had, had a few pilot teams and, and, and I proved that this approach of actually trusting development teams with the security of their own products worked. We showed actually fundamentally uh, huge uh, reductions in risk with this approach for a much smaller effort, especially on the security team's budget um, to make it happen. And, and then over the course of five years, I changed my mind a dozen times. I made a lot of mistakes. I learned a ton and I ended up with a pretty, in a pretty good place to the point where pretty much all of AppSec was being done with the model that I created. And, and um, it was all 600 development teams at Comcast covering roughly 10,000 develop, 10, developers. A very flexible process, not as prescriptive, just like Scrum is really flexible, but at the same time, it's prescriptive in the ways that it needs to be. It was that kind, it's that, it was that kind of model we ended up with in the end. Um, I'm gonna talk about that here now um, and walk you through it. So we did have to introduce two new roles. And the first of those two roles um, was, was, a, was something I call a coach. And you can call it an AppSec coach. You can call it a secure SDLC coach or SDL, if you're familiar with that Microsoft term, which means secure development lifecycle, not software development lifecycle, um, or a DevSecOps coach, whatever you call it, they're a coach. And I really like the term coach. Um, but interestingly enough, I hire scrum masters to fill this role. And, and that, that's sort of a, uh, a lot of times people stall in their transformation because they can't hire the right skilled people. And they think they need folks that are really skilled in security stuff to help them with the transformation. Um, and those are difficult to find, especially nowadays. Um, but I can actually go to, a, to and find a scrum master around and I can teach them or actually the framework that I've packaged up that they don't actually have to know much out of the gate to be a good coach. They just have to be used to working with development teams in a sort of advisory consulting coaching sort of mode. And then we follow this process that gradually helps development teams to improve. And, um, and, and I'm going to talk about the list of practices in a minute here, but um, I, I think that's that people overfocus on that too early. Um, I think any decent security group will come up with a decent list of top end security practices development, they wish development teams were doing. Um, I, I think the tough part is not that list, coming up with that list. I think the tough part is getting people to actually adopt them in a deepest, deep way, not in a checkbox sort of way to make you go away and satisfy some policy. Um, and so that's really with the focus of this framework. And I, I developed this, call it a maturity model if you will, but I hate that term. Um, it goes from thoughts to words to actions to culture. THWACK is the acronym for it. Basically, if we don't know the status of your adoption of this practice, it's unknown, it's this blue color. Um, if, if we've introduced it to you and you're now thinking about it, it's thoughts. If you've actually made a concrete plan in the next 90 days to start to adopt it, it's words. If you partially adopt it, maybe you're halfway along in that adoption plan. Maybe you've got five of your 10 apps covered. Maybe you've got seven of your 27 people trained, whatever it is, then that's actions. Um, and then if you're doing it in every place that you could possibly do it, that's culture. Um, and so the process that the coach uses to get people through this is they sit down with the development team 
Um, and they're going to do a partial gap analysis with their current practices with this sort of ideal um, 40 practice, big, huge table. But we're not going to talk about all 40 practices like an audit would in one shot. We're just going to focus on the key six ones in the upper left corner of this table. And um, we're going to basically ask the team, are you doing this? And, and, and when they say, they say, yeah, we ask them to describe it. We have to have the whole team in the room when we do this. So we're not going to get snowed by some team lead that just wants us to go away. Um, team leads won't lie when their developers might call them on it. So it creates a, a sort of a, a truth thing. We also have the business people or the product owners in the room as well. And I'll explain that why in a minute. Um, but we go through these first six top practices. And again, I'm intentionally not telling you what those practices are yet. I will on the next slide. Um, and if we come up with two to three, two or three that are not at culture, we stop the gap analysis. No sense embarrassing with the other, um, this 40 things in the table, the other, the other 34 things in the table. Um, let's immediately shift into planning mode for those six key ones. What would it take for you to adopt it? And this is where you really start to get deep conversations. Well, we're currently on this CI platform, but we're about to move to this other CI platform. So integrating this tool doesn't make sense because the work would need to be duplicated. You get that sort of planning can, uh, work going and you can actually really deeply get them to sort of internalize what it would mean, what they would have to do in order to actually adopt a particular a particular practice. And the, and the product people are in the room, the business people are in the room, and they're seeing this discussion happen. And that, that's really key. At the end of this 90-minute session, um, we literally go around the room, we ask every individual in the workshop to say if they support the plan. Do you support this plan? I need a yes or no, a verbal yes or no, like the if you're sitting in the exit row of an airplane. Um, and I start with the product people. And often they'll say no. The team decided that they were going to adopt two new practices, turn them one shade of green darker in the next 90 days. And I think that's too much. We have these huge product things we got to get out. Um, and like, okay, great that they're hearing you, we're, we're going to resolve this now. Um, what would we need to modify about the plan that would make you happy? And almost always, they, 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 they just knock a little bit off of the plan and everybody's happy then at that point. If you got out of the room with just the development team and the product people were not in the room during the thing, they could essentially invalidate all of your planning that you make. And this happens a lot when security folks talk to the team lead or the developers and the developers understand how risky the, what they're doing is and they ask the product people or the business people for time to work on it, they get told no. And so this basically gets rid of that barrier right up front so that we don't have it. And then the coach will intensely work with that team over the next 90 days to help them achieve their goals that they set in the workshop. And then they'll do another workshop. Maybe you'll pick off the next 12, six most important practices. And then you'll eventually get into the sort of, uh, you know, optional practices that only apply in certain circumstances. Um, and over the course of these 90 day work sessions, um, you can, you can get teams to very high levels of maturity in about a year and a half. And, um, you know, that sounds like a long time, but security groups have been complaining about developers not doing this well for a lot longer than that, and not had a lot of success, just browbeating them into it. Um, this actually is a way, a path, a shallow on-ramp to actually get them to do it. And this is essentially the heart of the whole, the whole uh, framework. This is what it looks like when they're, they're done. And there's the list of practices. Um, this is a tool called Greenhouse that I led the development of at Comcast. And I'm currently working on an open source version of. Um, you click on one of this and it has a description of the practice. Um, by the way, I'm not going to hard code the, the practices. They aren't hard coded into Greenhouse. Um, uh, at Comcast either. Um, they're all textual editing and every organization will be able to create their own sort of list of formulation of practices um, with this. Second key role we need to introduce in order to pull this off um, is, is the pipeline engineering team. And I say pipeline engineering team, but um, it, I, I don't want to hire people that would actually label themselves as ops engineers or new literally calling themselves DevOps engineers. I really want true developers. I want folks that are writing code on Friday and they start a new job working in for me on Monday. 
um, in this pipeline engineering role. And they continue to write code in this role. And I don't just mean scripts and stuff. I mean, they are writing apps. That greenhouse app was built by this pipeline engineering pool of folks that I had at Comcast. I ended up with, you know, roughly, you know, uh, you know, five to 10 um, pipeline engineers. And, and in any given quarter, one or two or three of them were working on heads down just on application or tooling development. Um, the beauty of this is that, is that they really are still relevant development skills and they can keep talking to de development teams and they have credibility when they talk to them. They'll also do it in an automated way. They, so a typical security pipeline engineer at, at a large organization is probably only comfortable configuring in a UI the plugins for Jenkins. These are folks that could write the Jenkins plugins. And we did a lot of that kind of work um, at Comcast. And, and that's the sort of level of do it like a developer would do it, I really want. The other sort of, and this was, this was actually huge value, but it was, it was always underrated by my bosses at Comcast. But these folks were dogfooding the very practices, the very framework we were trying to get other development teams to use. Remember, they're a development team. They built a really huge app, actually, over the course of five years at Comcast, this team. Um, and they were using all of the tools and all of the practices. They were dogfooding everything. If, an, if a group inside of Comcast came to me and said, we bought this new tool and we want you, because you talk to all the developers with these coaching sessions, we want you to start to introduce them to it. I'd be like, well, first, our team needs to start using it. And you don't know how many times I stopped false, false starts, prevented false starts from happening. Things where you try to roll it out and it's just not quite ready to be rolled out. And, and I prevented that from actually um, interfering with the rollout. Um, Joseph went on video there. Is there something you needed to say, Joseph? Or Nope, you're going off video. So I think that was a mistake. Um, next key element of the prototype is, is that um, we uh, want to plug in. This was, became a sort of a hard and fast rule for the team. Um, we want you to think of security as an attribute of quality. So in order for that to be true, we want the feedback for security bugs. A vulnerability is just a particular kind of bug, right? We want that to, to be detected in the same spot in your SDLC and fed back to the same spot in your SDLC. And if you use automated testing, it's typically not going into a JIRA ticket. A lot of DevSecOps tool vendors and a lot of DevSecOps leaders inside of enterprises celebrate the fact that we can now put the vulnerabilities into the JIRA for the team. And that's now in their workflow. And, and that's better than the, what they were doing before, which was emailing them a spreadsheet of the list of vulnerabilities. Um, but but if, if it fed back in the pull request or in the pipeline, that's much more likely to get, to get responded to. And that's if the team is mature enough to get quality feedback in that place, then that's where it should. You never have to create a ticket. You never get that overhead of that happening. And so that is actually a huge savings. It feels lighter weight. It goes faster. And, and so the pull request is the ideal place for that. And the reason for that is the developer is essentially in love with the code this, or she wrote this morning. They want nothing more than their peers, their friends, to say how you know, wonderful this new heartthrob of theirs is. And if you surface uh, a red X that would block the merge button um, in a pull request, then um, they will look at that red X and before the reviewer looks at it and they will resolve whatever it says because they don't want to be embarrassed by that red X in front of their, in front of their peers. Um, by the way, I, I don't think we went over this before we got going and I don't have the chat up. Um, okay, looks good here. So, but we're gonna do Q and A on the Slack channel. So hopefully you guys have access to that now. At the end of this talk, I actually have a slide where you will get access to it if you don't right now. Um, there's a link to it. I'll have it up on screen. You can type it in. Um, so the developer will jump through hoops. And, 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 and this is very different than if you put a JIRA ticket in and it's three weeks later that they get that. And that's on the work they did three weeks. They already moved on to a new heartthrob. That's the code they wrote this morning and not the code they wrote three weeks ago. And the JIRA ticket way is, is typically in that sort of three-week range. It has to get scheduled into another sprint at best case. Or if it doesn't get scheduled into the very next sprint, it's typically longer than three weeks before and could be much longer than three weeks. Um, 
and, and they are less familiar with the code and, and the learning is so much harder because they have to go back and it, it just does, it misses the boat on, on a lot of things if you do it um, in the Jira ticket way. Key prototype element number eight um, is around this sort of learning effect. Basically, the learning effect is 100 times more powerful than the find and fix effect. And, and, and the idea here is that when, you, when something is found by a tool or a, an incident occurs in production or a security incident or a reliability incident, whatever it is, there's a, um, a finding from a, a, a pen test or something, um, the normal thing to do is to treat that like a checklist. And you want to fix those things that were absolutely found. Um, I, I say that you want to turn that thing that was found into a pattern and you want to look for that pattern elsewhere. Even if it wasn't found by this check, you want to see if it's anywhere else in this code base than any other code base. So that's 10x more effective if you just do that. And then you want to put in place something that prevents you from ever doing this again. And this doesn't just apply to this project. It applies to every project that developer is on forevermore. Now, there is a half-life to learning. But it, assuming they keep current with it, they're, they're, they're going to actually write much, much fewer vulnerabilities in the future. And this essentially flattened the findings curve to near zero slope. Um, when we saw this finding effect kick in and it was incredibly so much more powerful because, you know, if you don't write it in the first place, there's no work to track it or find it or get rid of it or whatever. So imagine how much more effective that is. So if you want to focus on this, there's this, this concept of contextual learning and you can find the Wikipedia page on it. Um, and it talks about these three aspects of contextual learning, situated, social, and distributed. And when all three of these factors are true, when um, your when the when the work, the learning is actually something you need to accomplish in order to get the current work done. So let's say there was a finding that shows up in the pull request, and the developer wants it to get approved, um, but knows it won't get approved with that vulnerability in it. But there was a click, a link they could click on that took them to a two minute video that, that just showed them that one particular, what a SQL injection is, a two, two or three minute video. Then they're gonna listen and pay close attention to that exercise so that they actually learn how to get rid of SQL injection vulnerabilities. And, and uh, so it's, it's powerful if you do it in that mode. By the way, um, you know, I don't work for Secure Code Warrior, but I know they're speaking here. Um, I, I, I've spoken for them before in webinars and stuff, and they do this. They integrate with lots of tools. Um, uh, the company I work for, Contrast Now, happens to be one of those tools, but um, you, you, can, you can do this, and, and they give you this sort of just-in-time contextual learning. Um, code bashing is another alternative from check marks that um, uh, I think also does a pretty good job of this uh, if, if you're using tools that it integrates with. Um, it has to be social, meaning it has to give you credibility with that social group. And if you think about the STEM learning fallacy for women, I think it's really falls down on this, on this social thing. I mean, they have the aptitude, they, it's just, it, it, they don't have the social motivation and it has to be reinforced by the organization. Um, so the last section here I have is on metrics, and I don't, I don't really have time to go through the details of the next four slides, um, but there's actually another talk I'll reference you to that actually goes into depth on the content of this um, at the end here. But, but just for a minute here, I wanted to talk about, about metrics, and this is the last section before I, uh, I wrap up here. Um, I use metrics for three purposes primarily, and I spent a huge amount of our, my budget, my energy, my resources on building robust metrics frameworks to do this. And I think security groups are underinvesting by a huge margin in this very important aspect. But first of all, I used it to gain sponsorship. I showed that 85% reduction in risk that got me the next round of budget for the next year. And, and, and not only that, but it also got the executives to say, you should onboard to Larry's program. Um, I used it to work and coach with individual development teams. Got I gamified the data. I had a leaderboard. I had I had sort of like celebrated successful accomplishments, um, that sort of thing with the metrics. Um, and then I also used it to tweak the program. And the talk I, I gave at our RSA conference sort of goes over some of the major things we found that were wrong with the program that we wouldn't have known were wrong if we hadn't analyzed it with data. Um, so these slides are the sort of the details of that. Um, this is the list of practices that um, prove to, be, to be, be worth it. And then this last section here is what else is needed. Um, we need a 10-page guide like the Scrum Guide. 
we need those certifications for professionals to go out there and help folks do it like Scrum has. Um, and we need a tool like the one I led at Greenhouse and that I'm building open source for in order to pull this off. And that will lead to an ecosystem um, for improving this, this framework. So thank you, please go to Slack and I'll be glad to sort of answer your questions there. This is a link to the Slack channel. Sounds like it was posted in the channel here by Harold just now. Um, I'm gonna go over there now and I'll spend time here there. Thank you very much. And it was a pleasure talking to you today.